Okay, and then the rest, well, okay, so, so I just wanted to get an idea sort of who does, who does the dark matter. Um, okay, so yesterday we heard about, uh, we looked at dark matter nuclear interactions, and we said that elastic nuclear scattering is not the best way to probe very light dark matter masses, and we need new concepts, new ideas. So I've listed here uh, quite a large number of ideas that have been developed over the last, you know, eight years or so, eight, nine years, and we will go through most of them at some level of detail, some of them in more detail than others. Um, but we're going to divide them up into dark matter electron interactions. So we're going to look at dark matter electron interactions with atoms or noble liquids, so like xenon or argon, semiconductors like silicon, germanium, scintillators. We'll look at two-dimensional targets like graphene, diamond, um, very briefly aromatic organic targets, which is a very recent thing, uh, Dirac materials, superconductors. And then we're also going to look at dark matter nuclear interactions, where we're going to uh, get back briefly to elastic nuclear recoils in helium, but then also discuss how we can extend it below an MEV down to KV masses by including additional sort of uh, off-shell processes that produce two phonons. We'll look at Bremsstrahlung, Migdal effect, we'll look at molecular targets, uh, and production of coherent vibrational modes, so optical phonons and, and acoustic phonons. And this I already mentioned yesterday, I'm not really going to spend much time on this, but in principle, one way to access low mass dark matter if you just give it a high, is, is if you just give it a higher velocity. So if it heats up in the sun or gets accelerated by cosmic rays, you can also probe very low mass dark matter. That I already mentioned, I'm not really going to discuss that again. But that, that is sort of, I think most of the ideas, uh, not all of them, but most of the ideas that people have thought about. And these have different, so these are all, you know, within the, the last eight, nine years. So it's pretty recent. It's a pretty active field. And there's probably room for several new ideas as well, perhaps from you. Um, and uh, they have different, you know, status. So, so some of the ideas are much more robust than others uh, in terms of viability, in terms of what, what you can do uh, in the near future. Some of them will require a lot of R&D to actually make work. But I'll try and give you an overview of that as we, as we go forward. Okay. So please interrupt with questions at any time. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay, so I'm going to close this now, and we'll start with dark matter electron interactions. <coughs> okay. Ah, so I'm going to, but you don't need to write down this table, what I, this, the list that I said, um, because I'm going to give those in some handouts, so you've got some link that you, that you got sent. Um, so I'll list them as well with references. Okay, so I'm not going to give references to anything in these lectures. There'll be references uh, in the additional materials. Okay, so let's look at dark matter electron interactions. So in particular, let's imagine now that we have an electron that's bound in some state, in some atom. Let's just imagine the simplest thing, in some atom. And we want to calculate what's the typical energy that we transfer that we get when the dark matter hits the electron and excites that electron to some higher state or ionizes the atom. Let's look at the kinematics of that. Okay. So consider dark matter electron scattering. So dark matter. <coughs> so dark matter colliding with a, a bound electron. and exciting it to some higher state. Which could be a higher level or um, an unbound state. So the idea is that we've got some system Here's the nucleus, for example. There's an electron around it, orbiting. The dark matter comes in, chi scatters off the electron and excites the electron to some higher state. So this is some system uh, X, which goes to some excited state, X star. Okay, And uh, I've got some momentum coming in, so some P. And there's some momentum going out, which is going to be P minus Q. So Q is going to be the momentum lost by the dark matter. Okay. Um, 
Now, the kinematics for this are very different than the kinematics for elastic nuclear recoils. And let's look at them. Okay. Now, first of all, what are some of the differences? The electron here is in a bound state. So what can you tell me about its momentum? What's the momentum of an electron in an atom? Not its eye, because you've worked on this stuff. <laughs> right, its eye. <laughs> huh? M Z alpha? M Z alpha? Yeah. yeah, okay. So that's sort of the typical momentum, but what in general, I mean, is it fixed? Is, does it have to be that value? It's a spread, okay. So basically there's a spread of momenta. Its momentum is not fixed. It's in a bound state, so it has a fixed energy, but it doesn't have a fixed momentum. So that's, that's, that's important, first of all. So, so let me just say kinematics, very different to elastic nuclear recoil. So first of all, uh, electron is bound, no definite momentum. So it has an arbitrary momentum. In particular, it can have an arbitrary high momentum, but of course that's suppressed by some wave function, by some that's going to be suppressed. Okay. Um, now you can still what we want to do now is we want to work out what's the energy gained by the electron and relate that to the momentum lost by the dark matter. Okay. So so the energy transferred to the electron, which I'm going to note uh, with delta E sub E. This can be related to the momentum that's lost by the dark matter. Which we're calling Q. <coughs> just via en energy conservation. And in particular, what we can do is we can write down that delta um, EE is the energy lost by the, by the dark matter. And in principle also, the atom, the nucleus, like the whole atom itself, can also get some recoil energy, which is going to be noted by minus delta EN. Now this is usually small, and we're often just going to neglect it. Okay. But I'm just including it here now for completeness. So this is the, um, since the atom uh, also recoils. Okay. So what is this? So delta, the energy lost by the dark matter, well, what we can do is we can just write down that this is equal to, so this is an overall minus sign. So the dark matter has some incoming velocity v chi and uh, mass m chi, so that's the momentum of the incoming dark matter particle. And then it loses some q and divided by 2 m chi. Um, and half m chi of e chi squared, that's the initial dark matter energy, kinetic energy. And then there's going to be some energy loss from the moment from, to the nucleus, so that's just minus q squared over 2 mn. Okay. And now what we can do with this, we can just simplify this. So um, there's a term here that's q squared over 2 m chi and a q squared 2 mn. So I can combine these terms and get some reduced mass. Now, this again is small, right? So I can, in principle, neglect this, but let's keep it for now again. So this is going to be equal to Q dot V chi minus Q squared over 2 um, reduced mass, mu chi n. Okay, and if the dark matter mass is much less than the nuclear mass, which is what we're assuming here, right? It's subject to be dark matter. Uh, this will just be m chi. The reduced mass will just be m chi. And that's the same as just neglecting this term here, or neglecting this term there. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah, so good question. So, yes, it can be absorbed. So, in that case, it will just get to um, a higher state. And then, in that case, the absorption energy, the, the amount of energy that's absorbed is just the rest mass of the dark matter. Right, and which so the dark matter is non-relativistic, so the kinetic energy half mv squared is essentially neg negligible, and the energy, the mass, of the energy that's absorbed is just the mass of the dark matter particle. So as I mentioned yesterday, that's that's totally fine process, 
And in particular, you can also imagine that whatever ideas we come up with for probing light dark matter, subject to dark matter scattering, we can also use them for dark matter absorption. Okay. But the kinematics is much, much easier there, so I don't wanna, I'm not going to discuss them in that detail. Okay. So that, that's a good question. Yeah. So here I'm looking at uh, not spin-spin interactions, but if you, it doesn't actually matter what the interaction is actually. It doesn't matter. So this could actually be a through spin interaction uh, because it's, here I'm just talking about the kinematics. Okay. So the interaction type I haven't yet specified. So, but typically I'm imagining uh, it could be you know some some dark photon or some scalar that couples with the electron. Um, it could be a spin interaction as well. The kinematics is, is the same. Okay. Just in terms of what the cross section is that you're actually probing, that's going to be different. Okay. Yeah. So, what we're talking about there is when the we hit the nucleus and the nucleus recoils, and the nucleus then disturbs the neighboring atoms. So there we're talking about much much higher energies, uh, you know, kV energies typically or many hundreds of EV at least. Here we're talking about just hitting the electron itself, not the nucleus recoiling. But here we're just talking about hitting the electron and exciting the electron directly. So before that we were talking about nuclear interactions, now we're talking about electron interactions. In this case? On the other case, well, you just imagine that the, you know, the um, nucleus gets a big kick and it just it barrels into through the other atoms. Um, and excites them, gives them energy, and then that can also transfer energy to the electronic states and excites them or ionizes them. Okay. So there you also get a lot of scintillation light, right? So you can excite, in xenon, for example, what happens is that you excite the xenon atom to some excited state. That then actually combines with another xenon atom to form something called an axima or a dimer, and that excites your photons mostly. But there's some charge that can still be created. But, um, yeah, you can get both. But if, for example, if it's a background photon, like a like a comp that Compton scatters, then it's going to create, of course, a lot more ionization because then it wouldn't tackle the electron directly. Um, also, what can happen here, which we'll talk about, is that when you hit the electron and the electron ionizes, the atom ionizes, and you've got some high-energy electron, there's some chance that that recording electron is also going to disturb the neighboring atoms, and you might get two electrons or three or four. So there's some probability for that as well. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, good. So this is an important equation, which basically tells you how the energy is related to the momentum lost by the dark matter and uh, the velocity of the dark matter. Okay. <coughs> Let me give it a uh, symbol, like a smiley face. Okay. So we can define the. So what we can do is, right? We can define the energy lost by the energy gained, or the energy transferred to the electron, um, as basically the energy lost by the dark matter, okay? So because this is small. Um, and sometimes what I'll do is I might, instead of using delta EE, I might also just use EE, okay? So this for, for notation. Now, um, the momentum here is arbitrary, as we already said, because the electron is just in some bound state. So we can ask, what's the largest possible energy transfer that exists? And to do that, what we can do is we can just differentiate this delta E with respect to Q and just maximize the equation and then see what delta E we get. And you can do that, it's very simple, maybe you can even do this in your head, but what you get is that the maximum energy transfer is essentially half mv squared. So the whole dark matter kinetic energy can be transferred to the electron. And that's a big, big difference compared to dark matter nuclear interactions. Okay, so let me write that down. Uh, okay, so let me just uh, make the notational point, so just make sure there's no confusion later. So define energy transferred to the electron as uh, delta EE, just denoted as E sometimes, and that's approximately minus delta E chi. And then, since Q is arbitrary, the largest delta EE um, is obtained by maximizing delta EE 
with respect to um, Q. And what you get is that delta EE is less than or equal to a half mu chi n V chi squared, um, which is, again, in the limit that dark kind of mass is much less than nuclear mass, it's just a half m chi V chi squared. Um, and <coughs> if I now take my largest dark matter velocity again, let's just take 10 minus 3 or so as a typical number. But, yeah, forget the largest. So if I just take the typical number, 10 to minus 3, right, a few hundred kilometers per second. Then if I just put in some numbers, so this would be 10 to the minus 3 squared. And if I put in some numbers, this is going to be equal to a half EV times m chi over m EV. Okay, so for an MeV dark matter, the energy that can be transferred to my electron is a half EV, typically. The maximum energy that's transferred, would be get, I would get that by taking the V, v Earth plus V escape, again, which case would be, like we said yesterday, about a factor of four larger. Okay, so about two EV for an MeV dark matter particle. Okay. But this is nice, right? So basically what we're saying is that, unlike nuclear recoils, we can transfer the entire kinetic energy. Okay. So we found our process where we can extract much more energy for light dark matter. So we can do something more with this energy. <coughs> okay, so unlike nuclear recoils, NR here, I'm just denoting nuclear recoils with NR. Here, entire dark matter kinetic energy can be extracted. Okay. <clears throat> now you can of course just ask for what momentum does this occur, right? So that you can ask what momentum does this occur? And the answer is this occurs for a momentum that's um, of order mu chi n v chi or again, taking the approximation that m chi is much less and smaller than nu the nuclear mass, it's just m chi v chi. Okay. Now, it's already, when you gave the answer to my question earlier, what's the momentum of the electron, already alluded to this. The momentum is arbitrary, but there's a typical momentum associated with the electron. So what's actually the typical momentum transfer and therefore the typical energy transfer that I would get in an atomic system? Now, let's look at that. <coughs> OK, so the question now is, but what is likelihood of actually obtaining a large enough delta E to um, excite the electron. So now let's think about the kinematics again. And just for now, let's think about dark matter that's heavier than the electron, so above an MeV, still lighter than a GeV, right? So we're in the MeV to GeV range. And let's think about this dark matter particle scattering of the electron in an atom. So what is the velocity of an electron in the hydrogen atom? The typical velocity. Alpha, okay? So the typical momentum is alpha me, all right? And if you imagine now having a bigger atom with many shells, then the typical momentum will be some z effective, some, some charge, effective charge that the electron sees times alpha me, okay? So alpha, though, is about, well, is 1 over, one over 137. Um, so what you have is you've got a light, dark, light electron that's moving at a speed of about 10 to the minus 2 times the speed of light. And it hits an electron, sorry, hits a dark matter particle that's moving at a much lower speed, moving non relativistic at about 10 to the minus 3. And is also heavier in our example now. Okay? The dark matter is heavier than MeV. 
So you've got a heavy particle moving slowly and a light particle moving quickly. So what's the typical momentum transfer that you get between these two systems? It just bounces off, okay? And basically, the typical momentum transfer that you get is actually determined by the electron momentum, okay? Not the, the dark matter velocity. Okay, so good. So, so here, electron is the lightest and fastest particle. in the collision. Okay, so V electron is alpha, which is about 10 to minus 2, which is bigger than 10 to minus 3, which is V chi. Okay. Um, and this means that the typical, so, okay, so let me just write here. So the typical velocity, making it slightly more general, is um, VE, which is some Z effective times alpha. And for outer shell electrons, or like for hydrogen, Z effective is just one. So with Z effective, about one for outer shell electrons. And it'll be larger than one for inner shell electrons, increasing more and more the, the, the deeper you go. <coughs> so larger for inner shell. So <coughs> the typical momentum transfer <coughs> is going to be, um, let's call this Q-typical, Q-tip, um, is going to be given by the reduced mass between the dark end of the electron and the relative velocity, right, in general. V rel, but that is just about, uh, well, that's equal to Me, because we're taking a dark, we're imagining now a dark and a mass heavier than the electron mass, times um, the electron velocity, because it's much larger. And this is Z effective times alpha times Me. And alpha Me, so that's just 511 keV over 137, which is 4 eV approximately. So this is Z effective times 4, sorry, 4 keV. Okay. So my typical momentum transfer is some Z effective. If you don't like the Z effective floating around, just put it to 1 in your head, okay? Uh, for the outer shell electron, that's a good approximation. So it's about 4 keV. Again, you can get larger momentum transfers, but that's not the typical one, which means there's going to be some form factor suppression for that. I didn't want to erase my smiley face. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so, so let me write this. So this is important. Okay, so Q typical is uh, Z effective times four keV, and from this smiley face equation now, um, at least if the dark matter mass is not too small, what we can do is we can just neglect this term here. And in that case, this delta E is just given by Q times V. So we can now calculate with this typical momentum transfer, we can just multiply by the velocity of the dark matter to get the typical energy transfer. All right? So from... Uh, equation, the typical energy transfer is uh, <coughs> delta E, which is uh, Z effective times 4 keV uh, times V chi, which is 10 to minus 3. So this is going to be Z effective times 4 EV 
um, typically. So the typical energy transfer that I get in these kind of systems is 4 EV, okay, roughly, order of magnitude. <clears throat> we can also write this differently. We can ask, what's the momentum that's required to obtain some delta E, right? So just another way of phrasing it. So if I again take this equation here, um, the minimum minimum uh, momentum transfer required to obtain some delta EE is going to be given by uh, Q and has to be larger than delta E E over V, right? So I'm just taking, just asking what the Q is for some delta E that I want. So I'm just dividing by V chi, neglecting the other term, which is a good approximation. And in that case, I get delta E E over 4 Z effective times E V times the Q typical. So this is sort of the same, same, well, basically the same statement here. But what it's saying is that if I want to have an energy transfer that's much larger than 4 Z effective EV, so Z effective times 4 EV, I need a momentum transfer that's much larger than my Q typical. And if I want an energy transfer where I just get 4 times Z effective times EV, then I can just be sitting at Q typical. Is that, is that clear? Yeah. So, uh, right, so, so that's right. So, so you won't typically you will not necessarily get the largest uh, energy transfer possible. You know, will not necessarily transfer half mv squared of energy. That's what you're saying. That's right. Is that what you're saying? No, no, I mean, for that, I, I'm okay with that. But then in some other cases, if I plug in a certain uh, mass of the dark matter, then the typical will be even larger than the largest that I can get from here. Oh, right, no, no. So you have to be careful that everything is, of course, uh, satisfied. But, um, well, let me see if I understand your question. Because for the largest, uh, for the maximized uh, energy deposit, that's the largest I can do. I can deposit all of them. Kind of that's right, that's right. Matter. Yeah. But if I choose a dark matter mass, this can be smaller than the typical. That's that, mean? that doesn't make sense. For the typical, it can't be larger than the largest allowed. Well, uh, not really, but I mean, so you have to make sure that this is, of course, satisfied. You can't ever transfer more kinetic more than the dark matter kinetic energy, right? So if, if that's, if the typical one is larger than this, that doesn't work, right? Right. right. So, so that, that's, that's true. Okay, that's yeah, that, that, that's true. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but this is just saying, let's take a mass that's large enough that I can transfer a lot of energy. Um, I'm just asking sort of generically what's the typical one. Okay. And of course, Q is arbitrary again, right? So you can transfer a whole range of delta E. It just might be that if you're sitting with a, if you want to transfer far above an energy far, far larger than 4 EV times the effective, you're going to be paying a penalty because it's going to be some form factor suppression because you need to sit on the tail of the electron momentum distribution. Okay. All right. Um, what this also tells you a little bit, right, is that in order to calculate now dark matter electron scattering rates and the spectrum, like how many electron, how many, what's the energy of the we call the electron, you need to actually know the momentum distribution very well of the electron. And small changes can make a big difference in terms of what the answer will be. So this is in some ways much, much more complicated to calculate than just dark matter nuclear elastic scattering. And what you need to do is in atomic systems or in semiconductor systems where you've got especially in semiconductor systems or other systems where you've got um, a many-body system with electrons interacting with multiple objects, it can be get quite complicated. And you need to use sort of sophisticated condensed matter tools to actually calculate these rates correctly. Uh, so that, that's quite a bit of work. Okay. And that's been done over the, over the years. <coughs> All right. So let me just write down the conclusion. Um, 
Well, okay, actually. So, so I think this is. Let me put a box around it. That's good enough. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. What's the difference between. So, why couldn't I have deposited all of the dark matter energy with nuclear recoil? What's the difference? Because I have two particles now. I have an electron and a nucleus. So that gives me the two terms. I mean, for the nucleus, it's, has, it's usually just. It's, it's heavy. It's, it's sitting there. You can imagine that it's basically stationary in the lab frame. The electron is not. Right? So in the lab frame, the electron is moving around at a velocity alpha. So what you can actually think about, another way to think about the dark matter electron scattering problem is that you have a heavy dark matter particle that's sitting there, and your atom, or the electron in the atom in your detector goes around, right, you know, goes around the galaxy and hits the dark matter and bounces off it. So the electron is going to basically just bounce off the dark matter particle. That's sort of a better frame to look at things. Um, and so it's just, yeah, so, so does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay, okay good. So now, um, let me just write down some formula for the electron rate. Okay, so I'm not going to derive them in detail, but I want to write down the formula so you've seen it, and then I can just explain some sort of important features and some of the conventions that get used in the literature. Okay, so... And again, in the thing that I'll put uh, online um, in, the, in the notes, there'll be references. So if, you, if you're interested, you can actually look at the, the references for, for that and the detailed calculations for this. So the rate, I don't like this pen. So the rate for dark matter to excite an electron from some level, uh, some ground state, so let's call this level one, to some excited state, level two, is given by um, R, one to two. So this has to depend on the number of dark matter particles, which we usually write as rho chi over m chi. Because we know rho chi is about 0.3 GV per cubic centimeter. And we write one right in terms of the dark matter mass. As we proportion to some cross section, and this is usually denoted by sigma E bar, and I'll define that in a few minutes okay, when I've written down the whole formula. But you can think of this as the dark matter electron scattering cross section, just of the free electron scattering cross section. And I'll explain why it's a bar in a second. And then there's some pi's, of course, and factors, so I'm just going to write those down. There's a reduced mass of the dark matter with the electron. <clears throat> and then we're going to have to integrate over the momenta, all possible momenta. Okay. And it turns out that that integral is going to be a d3q integral over 1 over q times some function which is going to depend on my dark matter velocity distribution. Right. So I'll define this function in a second. I'm going to write this down here. So let me write this v min which is going to depend on Q, momentum transfer, of, and the energy transfer between the two levels. So delta E, 1 to 2, times some dark matter momentum dependence. So this is part of the fundamental interaction between the dark matter and the, uh, the electron. And times some form factor, F, 1 to 2, which depends on the momentum transfer in general uh, squared. And now let me define all these terms. Okay. And the common between the Q and the delta E, right? There's a common between the Q and the delta E, not Q common. There's a comma. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Function of both things. Thank you. Um, okay. So where all these different functions are the following. So this eta function basically is an integral of, uh, of the rate over the velocity of the dark matter, the velocity distribution of the dark matter. So yesterday we defined this uh, g chi of v. That's the velocity distribution, like a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution or whatever it is. Uh, and I need to integrate over the possible velocities. And of course, I need to make sure that um, my velocity is larger than some minimum velocity, which is going to mean that, again, I'm sitting on this tail. Right? So remember that only the dark matter particles with enough velocity can actually, of course, give you enough energy. Okay, the ones that's uh, very small velocities 
won't be able to scatter. So there's some theta function where V has to be bigger than V min. And V min, you can just read off from this equation here. So just solve for V. There's some minimum velocity given some delta E that the darkener needs to have. So V min, <coughs> which depends on Q and delta E, is just going to be delta E 1 to 2 over Q plus Q over 2 m chi, or reduce mass m chi n. <coughs> okay. um, and then there's this form factor F1 to 2, which I'm just going to write in general. So this is some atomic or some crystal form factor, or whatever you want to call it. right over here. So in general, this is going to be some function where um, I've got to integrate over <coughs> all possible electron momenta, initial electron momenta, which are denoted here by K. So there's some two pi floating around. And then there's some wave function for the electron, which is some outgoing wave function. So that's the wave function of the excited electron times the wave function of the electron in the ground state. And we're not going to discuss in detail what these are, but basically you can think of this as if you've got some atom, it's just the wave function of the electron you know, in some xenon atom or whatever you want, in, some, in its state, whatever that state is that you're considering to, that, that does the scattering, uh, that's being excited. <coughs> and then there's some excited state, which has a momentum that's uh, the initial 1k plus q, okay, the momentum that was transferred to the electron, uh, and there's some overlap integral that you need to calculate. And this is where most of the work is, okay? because again, the electron is part of some many-body interacting system, uh, in case of crystals, or uh, even in noble liquids. So the calculation that have been done so far uh, for darkness scattering of xenon in, uh, in, in noble liquid xenon, so in the xenon detector, xenon 10 or xenon 100 detectors, they usually assume free atoms. That's not actually correct. That's not actually correct because the, electro the, the atoms are really in the liquid. So there's actually also some band structure there. So there's work ongoing to try and actually calculate this uh, in a liquid. But this is all non-trivial stuff, okay? and that makes electron interaction, these calculations, much more complicated than, uh, as I said, the, the nuclear, elastic nuclear scattering. Okay. <coughs> so let me just write here. This is where most of the work is. Okay, to calculate this properly. Now, good. So now, what are the other elements in this formula here? <coughs> so I've got this cross-section, sigma e bar, and also this form factor that I haven't defined yet. Uh, yeah, question? Um, yeah, so you have, okay, good. So this is, I, I've left some steps out here. So basically there's, in general, there's a cosine theta between the momentum and the dark matter velocity. What I've assumed is spherical symmetry. In principle, uh, I don't have to assume that, or I shouldn't assume that necessarily. Uh, but if I do assume that, then there's a cosine theta integral, which you can integrate over. Um, and <coughs> um, and in that case, then uh, you, you get rid of that, and then you just have to massage the equation a little bit. So I, I can refer to the references, but yeah. Um, that, that comes from that. By the way, I should say that in principle, right, there, it's actually quite interesting because if you think about dark matter scattering in a crystal, a crystal is a regular array of atoms, and depending on how the electron moves and which direction of the crystal, there's actually going to be a different probability, right? So depending on what the angle is of the dark matter coming in and the crystal axes, you can actually get a daily modulation. So if you imagine it's a fixed crystal on the, in some detector on the Earth, and the Earth rotates, the crystal axes are going to change with the dark matter wind. 
So you can actually get a daily modulation from that. Okay. Uh, but we're, we're here we just assume spherical symmetry, which is which is a good which is a good approximation. I mean, to see this daily modulation is really hard. Okay, it's a small effect, even for crazier target atoms, um, and that, that, that's pretty pretty challenging. <coughs> okay. All right. So good. So then, the getting back to the cross section momentum dependence. So we parameterized. The, so we have this amplitude squared, which is in general the dark amplitude squared for the dark matter to scatter of the electron. And we, as usual, we average over the initial spins of the electron and the dark matter if, it, if it's a fermion. <coughs> and we sum of the final spins. And we've parameterized this as followers, so this as follows. So this is basically the amplitude squared average. So I'm putting some bar on it. Um, and what we've done is we've written this uh, amplitude that depends on Q in general as an amplitude that will be fix some reference momentum, which we take to be alpha me. Why do we take it to be alpha me? Because that's the typical momentum. times some form factor which captures the momentum dependence of the dark matter. So what we've done is we've factored out the momentum tendence of this general uh, matrix element in some constant piece times some momentum dependent piece. That's the dark matter form factor, the momentum dependence. And then we've defined this sigma E bar to be the cross-section at a fixed momentum dependence. So this is going to be the cross-section for the dark matter to scatter an electron, so there's a reduced mass squared between the two, is going to be the alpha me piece, and then just some factors to get the right dimensions, of course, and the right mass dependences. Okay. Uh, how small does what have to be? So alpha me is fixed. Alpha me is just fixed. Alpha me is 1 over 137. Yeah. How small does the cross section have to be? For what? So that depends on the model in terms of what it is. I'll write down an expression in a second. But you're asking what are the limits on that? OK, so we'll discuss that a little bit, how, how we derive limits. But it's uh, for, if you imagine some heavy mediator, I think around 10 mV or so, it's 10 to minus 37 centimeters squared. Okay. But I can show you plots. Yeah, if you want. Okay. Yeah. What are the conditions for the cross-section factorized in this way? So, <clears throat> so this works for uh, many cases. There was a paper recently which, so for example, for a heavy scalar or heavy dark photon or a light dark photon or, or light scalar, it works. Um, it works uh, pretty well for an electric dipole moment interaction or magnetic dipole interaction. There are other types of interactions where you've got some anapole moment where you have to be a little bit careful. So there was a paper recently by Timon Emkin and, and others, just maybe a month ago, where they looked at other types of interactions and wrote this in more generality. Okay, so I, I don't have the reference here, but I can give it to you. Okay. Um, but yeah, this, this works reasonably well, and that's sort of been the standard um, for a while, but people have done this very recently slightly more generally as well. Uh, the bar? Oh, the subscript, sorry. Um, free. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Um, my fantastic handwriting. Okay. Uh, you, so you had a question? Uh, uh, the same question? Oh, God. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sir, uh, you mentioned it, but um, for the form factor here, uh, how, how do you deal with it? The form factor. You know, how to calculate this? The, oh, oh. The, uh, oh, this one? Yeah. Uh, in terms of what do you mean, how do you deal with it? So what, how do you, uh, what do you put So that depends on the model. So I'll write down the form factor for you now for a dark photo interaction, just to give you an example. So basically what we do, I'll, I'll, let me write it down, then I'll, then I'll answer your question. Okay. Do you have a question? Yeah, so this is sort of related to what you were asking me earlier, and I probably should know this, but isn't the, the integral in the F1 to 2, doesn't, shouldn't it be like also over F1? 
SPM, like you integrate over the matrix seven, basically, and doesn't that modify some of the I remember, you no? Know? Uh, so, which, which... Oh, the integrate is over DK, not over Q, sorry. Okay, okay. I mean, so, yeah, so indeed, so I think, I, I think you're actually asking a very good question, I think. Maybe. I mean, usually you do, so, so <laughs> but, uh, uh, so, so generally, you have to be a bit careful, so I've done, made an assumption here, uh, and I said this works well for, like, a dark photon mediator or so, or electrodyper moment, I think it works all, all well. But for some interactions, you actually want to keep this Q integral. Um, well, you, you, the, the form factor may have some K dependence. That's what I want to say. So FDM of Q may actually depend on K on the electron uh, initial state as well. So I've assumed here it does not. And that's OK for a lot of interactions, but not for all interactions. In that case, actually, it uh, becomes more complicated because when you calculate this wave function, um, where am I? Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, so when you calculate this wave function, actually the FDM needs to go in here as well. Okay. That has not been done in all generality. So I guess this, this, this paper by Timon Emkin and, and others, uh, Katena, Ricardo Katena, and, and maybe someone else, I forgot now, sorry, uh, that, that, that did that for some things. Okay. Okay, good. All right, very good. Um, yeah, so let me just write down an example. So there's something, uh, yeah, example behind this here. So for a dark photon mediator, so, uh, so I assume that most of you are familiar with, or all of you are maybe even familiar with sort of a dark photon interaction. But the idea is that there's some chi dark matter that couples with some dark photon, which I'm putting here in A prime, and it scatters with my electron. There's some interaction between the dark photon and the dark matter, which is some coupling G dark, G sub D. And then there's some interaction of the dark photon with the electron, which is typically written as some Canadian mixing parameter epsilon times the electron charge, E, okay? And uh, so if I've got some type of interaction like this, then my sigma E bar, you know, is calculated, right? And it's really just calculating this, this cross-section and putting Q equal to alpha ME, okay? That's what the definition is. And what you get is it's 16 pi <coughs> mu chi e squared alpha epsilon squared times alpha dark, right? So the couplings get squared, g dark squared, epsilon squared, e squared is just, and then you put some four pi's there, you get alpha dark alpha. There's a reduced mass. <coughs> and in the propagator, you get this ma prime squared plus the momentum transfer fixed to be alpha me. like that. Okay. And then the form factor, FDM, that factors out the momentum dependence. So that's going to be equal to, in general, MA prime squared plus alpha squared ME squared divided by MA prime squared plus Q squared. So that's momentum dependence in it. And that's going to be depending, that depends on, so the precise momentum dependence now uh, depends on what the dark photon mass is. But if you take some heavy, heavy dark photon, much larger than the momentum transfer that you get, then this is just a constant. It doesn't depend on momentum. And if you take some dark photon mass that's very, very light, then you have a momentum dependence sitting there. Okay, so in the two limits, this is approximately equal to 1 for MA prime much bigger than alpha ME. And it's equal to alpha squared ME squared over Q squared for MA prime much less than alpha ME. Okay. Um, so for a heavy dark photon, the form factor is just one. There's no momentum dependence. For a light dark photon, you get this 1 over Q squared. In the cross section, that's a 1 over Q to the 4. And as I mentioned yesterday at the end of the lecture, that's where direct detection really has much, much more power than sort of other puzzle probes, accelerator-based probes. Because in that case, the tiny momentum transfer that you have for Direct detection compared to the large momentum transfer that you have in colliders really, really boosts the cross section. Okay, and you can probe orders of magnitude of more parameter space uh, in those cases. Um, yeah. Uh, 
Um, maybe it's the three momentum. Yeah, it's three to momentum, yeah. <coughs> okay. And then, okay, the other thing I should say, so what I've done here is, right, I've calculated the rate for level, transition from level one to level two. Now, of course, in reality, you have many level ones, possibly, that give you some particular delta E, and many level twos. So to calculate the spectrum, you have to sum over all possible level ones and twos. Okay, and you can do that for different, different things. I'm not going to write this down, but you can calculate that, that cross-section pretty easily from, from this here. Okay. All right, very good. Now, okay, so now what are the possible target materials that you can have for dark matter to scatter of an electron? And for that, um, I wrote this before the lecture. So here's some examples. Okay, uh, you don't have to take the notes. Again, I'll make those, I'll give those things, uh, hand those out with references. But here's a list of target materials. So noble liquids, semiconductors, diamonds, synthetes, etc. Examples of the particular elements. What the binding energy is of the most loosely bound electron. And what the mass threshold is if you just excite that loosely bound electron across the minimum excitation to see something. Okay. So for noble liquids, which are commonly used target materials, so that's sort of an important thing to start with, xenon and argon. So the binding energy is of order 10 EV. So uh, right, hydrogen is, is 13.6 EV. Uh, for xenon, it's 12.4 EV or so. For argon, I think it's like 16 EV. So it's of that order, of order 10 EV. Okay. <coughs> and that means that the mass threshold is about a few MeV. Why? Because it's just a half MV squared. So if I just take my, if I just ask what's a half MV squared to get 10 EV, that gives me my mass. And again, I take my velocity to be, you know, V, uh, v escape plus the V earth to get the maximum possible um, velocity, maximum possible kinetic energy for the dark matter. But that's the lowest mass you can possibly probe if you want to excite and ionize uh, an electron in a, in a noble liquid. Okay? For semiconductors, so, so we're going to talk about all these in a little bit more detail, okay, some of them more than others, um, but I just want to sort of give this table here. So for silic silicon and germanium, binding energy is about an EV. And that means you can probe down to about 500 kV masses, right, very roughly. <coughs> diamond is an insulator, uh, at least for most of the ways diamonds occur. It has a binding energy of about 5 eV. And again, if you look for dark matter electron scattering, it has a threshold of about a few mEV. There are scintillators. Um, depending on what kind of scintillator you want to use, gadium arsenide has a low band gap. So that's basically a semiconductor that, that scintillates. Uh, it's about 1 EV, 1.5 EV. Sodium iodine, cesium iodine have, have a larger gap. They're, they're insulators, so it's about 5 EV or so. <coughs> There's two-dimensional targets that people have talked about, um, like graphene. Superconductors, which have much lower binding energies where you just try to dissociate like a Cooper pair, which has a few milliv binding energy. So that, in principle, if you're able to detect that signal, can get down to kV masses. And then Dirac materials, which are, you can think of them as low gap semiconductors with a milliEV gap. And uh, so zirconium pentatelluride, I think that's what it's called, is an example with a few milliEV gap. And uh, again, if you can see the signal, you can potentially access KEV masses. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to talk about each of these, give you a little bit of the experimental status of what people have already done, and discuss how... Uh, what kind of detectors people use to look for these signals, to look for electron recoils, okay? Depending on the material, you can get different signals that you have to be sensitive to. Um, and then we've, then we'll, so we'll do that. Uh, I'll go through these things, some, some very quickly, some a bit more detail, and then we'll turn to um, dark matter nuclear interactions. Yeah, yeah, so it's just um, binding energy. So um, delta E maximum, right, is a half m chi v squared. And v, the maximum dark matter velocity is v escape plus v earth, so it's about 800 kilometers per second. 
And what I need is that um, it needs to be uh, larger than the, the gap, the binding energy of an electron and an atom, or the binding energy of an electron to excite an electron across the band gap in a semiconductor. Okay, so. Well, that's a separate question. That depends on the detector. So yeah, so that we'll, we'll talk about, but yeah, yeah. Okay, but basically, right, just to give an example. I mean, if I take 10 EV here, so I want to get 10 EV. Uh, this is 10 to minus three, roughly, squared. So I put this on the other side, so it's 10 to the six times 10 EV. That's 10 MeV, in all the factor of two. Okay. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. I'm wondering what are your most important uncertainties when it comes to direct detection? Because, for example, you could imagine that the flux that we um, wrote out in lecture one might be you know, factored too high or lower. Like, what should I multiply bound by in my head to estimate the uncertainty? Or what's I mean, most important? To you? So it depends how conservative you want to be. Yeah. Um, I think reasonable, it also depends on what the mass, what mass range you're talking about, right? So if you look at a, if you look at a direct detection constraint, let me, I'm going to close this now. Are there more questions on this table before I close this? Yeah, okay, so I won't close it then, fine. Okay, one second. <laughs> uh, can I erase this here? Everyone's written there? Okay. So if you look at a direct detection limit, right, that's sort of what you're asking, like what's my um, uncertainty in the, in the direct detection limit. So it looks like this, where this is excluded. That again depends on the threshold. And the threshold is where the tail of the dark matter velocity distribution enters, because you, you know, the closer you get to the lowest mass, the lower you make m chi, the larger you need to make v in order to have some minimum delta e that you need, okay? And then you're sitting on the tail, and that tail is pretty uncertain. So, you know, things can change by quite a bit. And, and that means that if you're sitting at the lowest mass, it could change by, you know, many, many tens of orders of magnitude. But at high masses, I don't think, you know, I mean, you can certainly think of crazy scenarios where we're sitting in some void or something, maybe, right? In that case, the uncertainty is large, of course. But um, I would think it's, you know, I don't know, making something up, tens of percent. Yeah, but again, you can think of crazy scenarios, astrophysical scenarios, where maybe we sit in some void, and then there's, a, of course, all this is a waste of time that we're doing. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it depends on if you can read out the signal. Okay, that's one one question. How do you read out the signal? So if the dark matter does get of an electron in a noble liquid um, or in, in diamond that we just mentioned, what's actually the signal that you see and how do you detect it? Because what you're seeing is an electron or maybe a few electrons, right, if that outgoing electron um, excites other electrons around it. How do you actually see it? And for some of these things, it's not clear exactly. There is no detector that can sense very tiny energy depositions, but there's nothing that can sense a few milli EV energy depositions at this stage. So this, is, this doesn't exist in terms of practical things yet, but there's work going towards making detectors that are sensitive enough to this, um, which, is, which is very important, I think. Um, and diamond, so we'll talk about noble liquids, how to see the electrons there. Uh, with diamond, so with noble liquids, you'll see them with um, a two-phase TPC, which I'll explain in a few minutes what that is. And with diamonds, you'll put some transition net sensor on it and look for phonons, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so it depends what the system is. Experimental, experimental question, that's right. Yeah. When you say, though, yeah, most of this depends on the overlap. So on a purely theoretical perspective, like you take different classes of material that have the same gap, same energy gap, which is in principle same mass threshold. And when you do a computation at the rate, you can end up with material properties that will give you enhancement for better reason than the material that's together. Absolutely, right. So good, good thanks. I was going to talk about this a little bit more uh, in the future, and I, w I will definitely do that more. But for example, um, well, let's take an extreme example. A superconductor, if you have a dark photon mediator, for example, where it couples to charge, um, the superconductor, there's a strong um, suppression effect for any, for any photon uh, any photon coupling. So if you want to use a superconductor to probe uh, dark photon mediated dark matter, there's going to be a huge suppression. 
But Dirac materials will not have that same suppression. So using a dark photon, if you look for dark photon medi mediators, Dirac materials are much better than superconductors. But if it's scalar mediator, then it may not make as much of a difference. So it depends on the dark matter interaction. Right? That's the kind of stuff that, that you need. So that's important as well. So you want to choose different materials depending on what exactly, what kind of dark matter you want to look for. And since we don't know how the dark matter interacts, uh, we want to have a wide range of possible R&D efforts, research and development efforts to explore a wide range of materials and see if we can sense the signal in them. Does that answer your question? And we'll see, we'll see more of that. Okay? All right, good. <clears throat> All right, so in terms of um, what exists at this stage, so the first limits on dark ocean scattering were obtained with uh, xenon, noble liquid targets. And I'll explain how those systems work. Uh, and also more recently, there was a very nice paper by Xenon 1 ton where they put very strong limits on dark ocean scattering with, with xenon. Uh, dark side had limits on argon as well. And there's experimental efforts to try and build um, more xenon type detectors, okay, ongoing. For semiconductors uh, using silicon, uh, there have been several collaborations that are able to sense uh, single electrons and are able to put limits in dark matter. So I'll talk about that. And there's funded experiments to, to use silicon, uh, uh, to use silicon semiconductors to look for dark matter. Um, and then there is R&D efforts, uh, basically in everything else, in terms of the sensor applications, etc. Uh, in terms of the sensors to, to sense the particular signals. Um, yeah, okay, so and let's, let's talk about some of these things now. Any more questions on that? Okay. Okay, so let's let's quickly talk about noble liquids. Okay, so for for xenon, um, the outer shell electron, as already mentioned, has a binding energy of about so E B for xenon. The outermost shell is five p shell, it turns out, and that's about twelve point four E V. For argon. Uh, the 3p shell has a binding energy of about 16 EV. <coughs> okay, so outer shell electrons. <coughs> and um, in order to get enough energy to excite that electron, right? So if you go back to this one equation that I mentioned earlier, <coughs> so to, ion to ionize the outer shells, you need a Q that's larger than the delta EE over the typical. So let's take Z effect of one because we're talking about the outer shells. Q typical. <coughs> um, and since delta E needs to be you know, 12.4 or 16 EV at least, what we see is that we actually need a momentum transfer that's sort of larger a little bit than the typical momentum transfer. So this is larger than a few times Q-tip, or not larger, but approximately. So you sort of need to sit a little bit on the momentum tail of the electron to, to sort of ionize the, the, the atom, okay? So there's some suppression that you might expect from this. But of course, to know properly what the rates are, you just need to calculate the, the rates. You just need to calculate the wave functions for the electrons in the xenon or argon atom and just calculate this. <coughs> So small suppression in rates because you have to sit on a larger momentum transfer than the typical one. <coughs> okay. And in particular, what you can do is you can calculate this form factor, this, this ionization form factor for xenon uh, or argon. And just to show you what it looks like, uh, I'll just you know, sketch it. So ionization form factor... for atoms Let me go here So 
So as a summation, so the form factor is a function of Q, uh, units of KV here. And here's my ionization form factor, F ion squared. And just to sketch it, so basically it looks something like this, where it has a peak, and then at higher moment it has more peaks, etc. And this peak occurs at about um, a few kV, okay, as expected, because that's a typical momentum transfer. Um, and then Okay, very roughly, okay, it doesn't matter the detail. Okay, and then it drops sharply for larger momentum transfers. Okay, and this just tells you what we already expect from intuition, that if you want very large momentum transfers, you can do it. That gives you very large delta E, but it's just suppressed. And that means that the spectrum for the recall spectrum for darkness scale of what you get is it uh, falls sharply for larger delta E. Okay. So the lower your threshold is, the more the better able you sense low energy electrons, the you get a huge enhancement in the rate. Okay, so sharp drop. For large Q, which means large delta E. Okay. <coughs> now uh, yeah, okay, and just, just make it very specific. So scattering rates fall sharply um, as a function of E. Now, what's actually the signal? So, I already mentioned this, but if you hit an electron in a noble liquid, what happens is that the electron gets ionized. And then depending on how much energy it has, it might ionize other atoms. So you can get two electrons sometimes. If it has a lot of energy, you might get three electrons, sometimes four. So you get a distribution of electrons, one, two, three, four, that drops sharply, but you can get you know, five, six electrons as well, which is suppressed. Okay. <coughs> so outgoing electron can ionize other atoms. And even though this hasn't been measured at very lowest energy, one can sort of, it turns out one can estimate roughly how many additional electrons I get for a particular delta E. And it turns out that for every 14 EV or so of energy, I get an additional electron in, that, in, in xenon. Okay. So if my electron recall energy has, is binding energy plus 14 EV, I'll get two electrons typically. If it's binding energy plus two times 14 EV, I get three electrons. Okay. So very roughly. Okay, so now the question is, can these be detected? What does it say? Can they be detected? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Curious what Siri says. Anyway, the answer is yes. Um, and <clears throat> this has been done uh, by using Xenon 10 data, using Xenon 100 data, uh, using Xenon 1 ton data, and using dark side 50 data. Okay. <coughs> this is not a spectrum, sorry, this, this here? This is the form factor as a function of Q. I can convert that to a rate. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't do this here, but basically the rate That's for a single atom, but then you can use a from logical model, which hasn't been measured at very lowest energies, but you can estimate how many additional electrons I might get from that electron that recoils in my noble liquid. Okay, so the idea is that the electron recoils, has some energy, and it rattles around with the other atoms and can ionize them as well. And exactly how much ionization you get so you get about one additional electron for each 14 EV of deposited energy with initial electron, but that needs to be measured, still calculated from first principles, which hasn't been done. Okay. But yes, yeah, right. So basically, you get 
by the spectrum is going to be some falling thing as a function of EE. Um, and then for each 14 EV, you basically, you can just calculate, you get one electron, two, three, four. So anything in this range is, you know, one electron. Here you get two electrons. Here three, here four, etc. cetera. Okay. Um, and in xenon, each, uh, so in xenon, uh, the number of electrons you get is going to be given by the initial one plus um, EE minus E binding over 14 EV. Okay, this is clear. Hope this is correct. Okay. So basically, for any, so you're, if you deposit a binding energy amount of electron, you just ionize the atom, and you get one electron. The, the electron that's just ionized, uh, at the, with just you give it enough energy to overcome the binding energy, you can just get one electron. But if you have 14 EV of energy above that, it turns out then you get two electrons. Okay. And I can take some some flow of this. How are you to note it? Okay. Do you yeah. Exactly. Very good, yeah. So you don't see the initial electron, right? What you see in xenon detectors, as we'll talk about now, you see the number of electrons. You can measure the total number of electrons that you detect. One, two, three, four. Okay. Um, and uh, basically, you take your spectrum, divide it by 14 EV, and you just bin it in those electrons. Okay. Why hasn't this been measured? I mean, maybe I'm not this is something correct, but I mean, it doesn't seem that hard. So, I mean, part of it is uh, interest, uh, historically, it just wasn't that interesting to do, or didn't seem interesting to do. Um, I would have to think a little bit how you would actually do it, because you need to know how much energy you actually deposit on the electron, right? You need that input, and then you see what comes out. So I'm sure you can do it, but um, yeah, it just hasn't been done. Okay, but there's, I mean, the models that we have are not bad, they're decent, right? And people have used them several times in the literature. But it'll just be good to either calculate this from first principles or actually measure it even better, right? But yeah, yeah, I, so I don't have a very good answer for this, actually, but yeah, I don't quite know what the technological limits are. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. All right, so, so sorry, this was a little aside or continuation of the uh, top here. <clears throat> so now, can these be detected? The answer is yes, okay? But what we're looking for is a few electrons. Um, and this was done with xenon 10, xenon 100, 1 ton, and dark side 50 data. Okay, using xenon, obviously, for these collaborations and argon for dark side. And the way these work, let me just very quickly give you, um, that's one of several detectors that are able to send single electrons. <coughs> so here's my theorist explanation of um, the detector of xenon. Okay, so there's some box that they have. And in that box, they've got photomultiplier tubes on the top and bottom, which are my circles here. So these detect photons, PMT, PMTs, photomultiplier tubes. So they detect photons. So remember, we want to detect electrons. I have to explain to you how you get photons from this. But then what they have is they've got uh, two phases in this box of xenon or argon. So there's a liquid phase, liquid xenon or argon, and there's a gas phase. Um, and these are called two-phase for the obvious reason that they have two phases. And they're called two-phase time projection chambers. Why are they called time projection chambers? Because huh? you don't see the tracks. But uh, So that was a rhetorical question. I'm going to answer this now, but if, if anyone knows. Um, but yeah, so let me, let me do that. Let me say why. 
So what you get is that, um, actually, let's, let's look at a WIMP. How do they detect WIMPs? Okay, this is the big LZ, Xenon Enton detectors, Xenon 100, the historical detect the, the detectors in the past, Xenon 100 running. Uh, that's how they detect WIMPs. So the idea is that a WIMP comes in, <coughs> color, Let's say WIMP comes in and hits a nucleus, okay? The nucleus recoils, and what the nucleus does, it, uh, what the xenon atom does, it excites the xenon atom. Um, it forms uh, an excited set of xenon. That combines actually with a ground state xenon atom, which then is some excited dimer, okay? That decays through ground state and emits photons, 7 EV photons. Uh, so the thing actually scintillates, and you get 7 EV photons out for the nuclear recoil. So you get lots of gammas all over the place. Um, now you can also get a little bit of charge, but not much if it's a WIMP interaction. So maybe one electron. The photons travel very quickly to the photomultiplier tubes and are detected. So what you see uh, the excited state decays. So the excited state of xenon combines with the ground state xenon atom and it just decays back to the ground state and emits a 7 EV photon, okay? So, so I'm, let me just talk about the WIMP just to contrast because I want to just tell you about the general WIMP and I'll contrast it with the electron recoil in a second, okay? This is nuclear recoil for now, so I just want to take a WIMP, okay? Let me take a WIMP. Uh, well, no, so you, the whole atom recoils, right? But it's, it's, you hit the nucleus and the whole atom recoils, it gets excited, and it then com turns out it combines with a ground state atom and forms sort of a bound state of a, like a xenon-2 state that's excited and decays and, and emits a photon. It doesn't actually matter. There's photons that come out. That, that's, that's all we care about now, okay? okay? So what you see in the photomultiplier tube is that if you look at the signal that you see, signal in PMTs, as a function of time, you see these photons that travel, of course, very quickly. So you see some bump. And then what happens is that what they actually have, they've got an electric field across this medium. Those electrons then start drifting up. They go to the liquid gas interface here. That's the liquid, that's the gas. They get extracted at high, with a high electric field. The extracted electrons bounce around the xenon gas atoms. They create additional light. So the xenon, the electron here, let me see how ambitious I can be with colors. So my electron goes up and then gets extracted and bounces around and creates lots of photons in that bouncing around. And those photons then go to the PMTs so what you see is that a while later, you see a second peak from the electron. And what you then have, is you've got some signal, the first signal, which is called S1, and the second signal, which is S2. And for a WIMP, what they want is they want to have a lot of photons and not much charge, because that's the interaction that you look for. So for a WIMP, S1 is much bigger than S2. Okay, so the photons that you get from the initial excitation process is much larger than the, uh, the photon signal from the electrons, okay, the S2 signal. Um, and backgrounds for them are sort of Compton backgrounds, electrons, which create a lot more charge. So what they do is they look for signals that have a much larger S1 than S2. And if it's S2 is larger than S1, they discard it. It's, a, it's an electron. They don't discard it, sorry. But it's just a, it's a background event. So for WIMPs, S1 is much bigger than S2. <coughs> but for us... For dark matter electron scattering now, I don't hit the nucleus, I hit an electron, and what I get is an excited electron, and I get um, that that electron then drifts, and then maybe I get a few electrons from the initial event, so a few electrons drift, and then I see a few electron signal. So what I have is I don't have an S1, I only have an S2. Okay. I only have the, the electron signal.
you have a little bit of S1. The problem with the PMTs is that they're pretty noisy. So if you get one photon or two photons, that's not going to help you, right? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Yeah. Okay. There's some light that comes out. So for so for a wimp, you get this. For subject dark matter, you okay. Let me draw this very quickly. Uh, my gas, my liquid, my PMTs. So the dark matter comes in, hits my electron, and I, maybe I get a few electrons here. They drift up, and I get a lot of gammas that appear here. Okay, so what I get, the signal is going to be nothing, and then I get a little S2 peak. Okay. And the thing is that they see a lot of photons for each electron. So like of order 20 photons that they detect for each electron. So it's not a small signal. So it's actually very easy for them to detect single electrons. So detecting single electrons is easy for xenon. So many, what are 20 um, photons? Easy to see. The problem, yeah, before I get to the problem, Sir, let's first the hear the good part. Yeah, go on. Um, so, uh, the PMTs itself, for a photon, it's a few EV. I mean, there's some distribution, some quantum efficiency. I forget exactly where it peters out, I, yeah, but it's a few EV. Yeah. So, oh yeah, so you mean from, from dark and electron scattering? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so what you can get... Well, there's, there's various things you can get, right? So, for example, if you ionize an inner shell electron, that can ionize, then leave the hole. Then an outer shell electron can fall down to the inner shell, emit a photon. That photon also has some probability for converting it into charge, because it can hit another, right. another atom. So you, again, would get charge from it. So at the end, you always get some amount of charge from it. But yes, that, you know, people have attempted to model this to try and take this into account, yeah, the photons that, that you get as well. If it's just one electron, like the outer shell electron being ionized, then you just get one electron. But if you give that one a lot of energy, you might get two or three electrons from that. If you ionize an inner shell electron all the way up, you will also maybe get another photon out that can ionize other electrons. So there's a whole possible array of processes that can happen, yes. And that, that goes into the details of setting a limit, which makes it, which makes it more non-trivial okay. and more uncertain, to be precise. Yeah. Okay, so that's all the good stuff. But, oh, sorry, yeah. So um, usually you always get some electrons with the with, uh, nuclear interaction as well, just less. Okay, so if you see a large S1, you'll have some S2, it's just small. But also the S2 signal that you get is, is large, like one electron will produce 20-ish photons, right? Uh, so, um, and then also if it's two electrons, you produce 40, so it's like quantized. You can actually estimate, depending on how many photons you see, you can actually estimate how many electrons that it originated from. Uh, you're right, there's, there's some possible confusion with, 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 uh, S, with just that it's an S1, but it's less likely because not many things should produce an S1 by itself. Okay, that's why they're so good at detecting WIMPs. They basically have a background-free search in a ton-year scale of exposure, these experiments. That's amazing, right? They basically have no backgrounds to having a large S1 compared to an S2. It's, it's really an amazing achievement experimentally. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. The time information tells you how long the electron drifted, so it tells you how deep it was created. Uh, if you have a few electrons, what can happen is that they, they drift apart a little bit, they spread out, and then when they create the signal photons, they will spread out across multiple photon, multiple PMTs. So you can look at what PMTs light up, and that gives you some depth information as well. But, yeah, I... Um, Can be 
could be anywhere. Yeah, you just want to have an S1. You just, it'll just be some peak, which has some multiple of 20 photons that you can detect. A rough multiple, I mean, it's not precise, right? There's some distribution, of course. Neutrons, well, not comparable. The, the, the WIMP background is from neutrons. For, that's one example, right? The background is uh, It's Compton's, right? So electron scattering and then just fluctuations, right? So if you have many, 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 many electron background events, like from photons, from a radioactivity around the detector, they see that at many events. Uh, but they'll usually have larger S2 than S1 with some particular ratio, right? What large, I'm not defining what large means, but, but they define it. Uh, and then there's just a question of the tails. Like, is there some chance that there's some photon background, quantum background that fluctuated to give you a larger S1 compared to an S2? And then they set their boundaries depending on what the probability is of getting that. Uh, but they tend to be background free. Yeah, they've managed to achieve that for WIMP searches. Okay. That's how the detector works, because then they get two different uh, signals, and they get timing information, right? They know what the depth is. So sometimes you worry about things coming from the edges, right? So there, there might be you know, edge effects where the end, end of the detector sits. So what they usually do is they, they fiducialize actually the region. They actually look at only a sort of an inner volume, um, very roughly. They go away from the edges, uh, and they want to they want to fiducialize this, and they can do this with the timing information. They, they just know how long does the electron take to drift. Uh, that's basically just the distance between the S1 and S2 signal. Um, and what this does is that it te they tend to be more, right, if a photon background comes in for the WIMP search, it tends to interact on the outside of the detector as well. So they're going to get larger backgrounds on the outside of the detector, and then the photon will get absorbed and not actually make it to the very inner part. So they want to fiducialize this region, just take the inner part of the detector, which is super quiet, it's like self-shielding. Uh, in order to do that, they, they can use this timing information to, to, be, you know, to, to fix the z-axis. Am I answering your question? I hope, maybe. Yeah. Uh, So is there a way to acquire the depth of information? I mean, you need to, they use the gas because they, there's actually, there's an electric field across here, and then there's another extraction electric field, which is very large, which extracts the electrons to the gas phase, where the electrons then bounce around. Um, X mass only has one phase. That's one example of an experiment with only one phase. But having the two phases gives you additional information. Yeah, I don't quite know how you could do it, how to get the two pieces, uh, S1 and S2 information without the liquid gas. Um, I'm a theorist, though, so I have many deficiencies. But, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. If you have many electrons, then the broader it'll be. Um, not in time. Well, no, it could be a little bit in time, but just in terms of the number of photons you will generate to see. Because each electron is going to typically give you 20 photons, but sometimes 17, sometimes 25, right? And if you have multiple, there's some distribution, some Gaussian distribution that you get. Okay. Yeah? No, because um, it just means when S2 comes, right? It's, so the S2 signal, you know, it just depends on the time that it comes, but, but that so doesn't help you. Oh, it doesn't create additional electrons during doing that. That's what you're asking. Drifting does not give you additional electrons. The electric field is not that large. So it doesn't like pull it like crazy and create additional electrons. It does not do that. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah good question. So solar neutrinos can do that, but uh, they don't do it very often. So you can get okay. So you can get dark matter. So you can get neutrino scattering of electrons. Um, the neutrinos have MeV of energy, which is quite large. And if they scatter an electron, they'll give you a lot of charge, a large S two signal. 
not just a few electrons for the dark matter search. Those are easy to separate. So you can still make space on the photon count? Like yes, the on the signal, the number of electrons. Now, dark matter scattering of nuclei, coherently, where the nucleus gets a recoil, that can also give some charge. Right? And that, is, uh, that can give you one or two electrons for kilogram year exposures. So you're right that solar neutrinos are a background once you get to exposures of order kilogram year and you're sensitive to single electrons. But yeah, so that, that's going to give you some events. And if you've got a 100 kilogram year, yes, you're going to see a few boron-8 neutrino events that scatter coherently of the nuclei. So I'll talk about this a bit more in the background section. But um, these experiments, as I'll now say, uh, have a much bigger problem because there's a much, much larger background, which is not solar neutrinos. Okay, so when we have to worry about solar neutrinos, that'll be fantastic because then we'll have solved many other problems. Okay, other questions? Okay. Ah, not good. Okay. Um, okay, okay, I'm just, let me finish the problem, please. Sorry, sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, questions are great. Okay. So let me just say, so the, the problem is that there's a big background, big uh, one, two, and three electron background. So even though these experiments are essentially background free for large number of electrons, or like for the WIMP searches, they see a huge background in one, two, three electrons, and then it drops very sharply. And there's multiple reasons for this. So one thing is that um, there's always these background events that happen and they don't care about them because they just discriminate them. Okay? They create a ton of electrons. It's easy to distinguish them. They're clearly not dark matter nuclear interactions. They're, not clear, they're clearly not dark matter electron scattering interactions for subdivided dark matter. But what happens is that they create electrons and they, those electrons drift up. And what can happen is that they sometimes get stuck at the liquid gas interface. And they get stuck for a little bit of time. And then they dribble out and they create a single electron. Okay? And there's a not large enough time gap that it gets confusing uh, in terms of whether you've seen a single electron event that's true or if it's just some leftover dribbling out of stuff. Okay, that's one background. The other problem is that, uh, right, you've got these events that create a lot of electrons. What happens is that this xenon liquid is super pure, but not perfectly pure. So there's like oxygen atoms in there. And those oxygen atoms, for example, can capture one of the electrons that drift by. And then you've got this negatively charged impurity where the ionization energy is like an EV. And then you get some other event that shines a lot of photons on it that ionizes the electron of this negatively charged impurity. And then you get the single electron that comes from the negatively charged impurity, which originated from some other event that was where the electron was just captured by the impurity. Okay. Then also there is a metal surfaces in here to create the electric field. The photons that you create can hit the metal surface. The metal surface has a work function of like 5 EV. That can ionize an electron. So there's lots of possible backgrounds, and there's not a real proper background model that exists for the single or two electron events at this stage. So there are efforts now by um, two collaborations. So one of them called ALBECA, which stands for Low Background Electron Counting Apparatus, where they want to build a 100 kilogram year exposure, 100 kilogram xenon detector to really deal with these backgrounds. How to deal with them? So you make them liquid super pure. You don't have any metal surfaces. You try to you know, create fused, use fused silica where you just cover all metal surfaces. There's no exposed metal surfaces that can be photoionized. Um, one idea is also to use an LED light so that whenever you've got some big event that creates a lot of electrons, where the electrons might get stuck at the liquid gas interface, you shine some LED light, you flash it, that will help these electrons kick them over the liquid gas interface. So there's several ideas to try and deal with these backgrounds, but um, that's still R&D going on. And then also there's something called dark side low mass, where they want to use argon to do the same thing, to do an S2-only search, to do look for dark matter hydrogen scattering. Okay. okay, so there are efforts going on to, to really overcome these problems, but these detectors have set the best background, uh, best limit on dark matter hydrogen scattering by far for dark matter masses above 5 MeV at this stage. Okay, so they, they give the best limit. Uh, okay, so tomorrow, I'll stop now. Tomorrow I will talk a little bit about semiconductors, and then we'll go through the other ideas uh, in two lectures tomorrow. Okay, so we'll have some fun. Thanks very much. Yeah.